Uh, my name is Abir. Yeah, I studied architecture, but then I did a master's in urban planning. But then as soon as I finished my academic studies, I found a very big uh, value in research per se, and in urban research more particularly, but I wasn't interested in, uh, in academia. So I found that it was very important to, to produce knowledge, to do studies, but that it was more important to disseminate this knowledge in different formats, different languages, uh, and different ways of communication. One of the projects I'm going to talk about today uh, tackles like this concept primarily, and it's sort of similar to <coughs> other research projects I work on, where uh, ways of dissemination and ways of engaging with different audiences is an integral part of the research project itself. I started in 2009 a project uh, with my uh, collaborator in the Dictaphone Group. We started something called the Dictaphone Group, which is a research and performance collective. So the idea behind this group was that uh, we conduct research on the city. It's very based on socio-scientific research. But then we try to find ways on how to engage audiences with the concepts that come out of the research, but in more interactive tools. One of the first projects we worked on was The Sea is Mine, which tackled the issue of Beirut's coast, and mainly the history of the, of the seafront and the troubled relationship we have it with the seafront today as dwellers in the city. So a very important part of the methodology that, uh, that we had in, in this project was actually looking at research from a multidisciplinary perspective. And this is what's very interesting about the diversity that you have in this class, that you're all coming from very different disciplines. Actually, what enables you all to be working on a potential same research topic is that it's a research on space. And this is the most important, the most significant aspect of studying space or places is that it encompasses all other disciplines. So you can look at space from an anthropological, sociological, scientific, urban, uh, media perspective. You can look at space through all these layers. So in the research phase, part of the project was to look at the seafront from a legal point of view. So studying it legally, studying the history of the legal framework that produced it, and studying the reality of the legal context. A very big, big part of the research encompassed looking at the zoning of the area, looking at the current master plan of Beirut, but also looking at the consequent laws that have been designed over the years and that themselves produce the situation that we have today. So before this project, everybody, like media outlets and so on, had a very big uh, major discourse saying the illegal privatization of the seafront. This was like major slogans in the early 90s in newspapers. Based on the research that we did, it was actually these developments were not really illegal encroachments on the seafront. They were actually a product of a legal framework that's been designed to cater for private developments, real estate interests at the expense of open spaces and at the expense of uh, the, public, the public being able to access the sea. This legal perspective on research allowed us to really shift the discourse a little bit, so to not to keep on falling under the assumption of illegality because then it would be easy to blame residents for doing illegal actions, but rather shift the debate towards uh, the state that's actually encroaching on rights, on basic rights, through their control of the legal framework. And this is very much like in parallel to a project that fellow activists had done in Bahrain about the privatization of the entire island. The project is called Bahrain Jazeera Bidun Bahrain. So they highlighted a similar aspect that the state was actually enabling the selling out of the entire, entire coast of the island and it became an island without a sea. We also used mapping as an important tool of dissemination and also an important media tool because once you're able to put all data and visualize them on a map, 
The map itself produces the several readings that you can say in one image rather than in pages of, uh, of text. So this mapping is a mapping of land ownership along the seafront. After we do this map, we realize that all lands along the coast are actually privately owned. And then again, this challenges the assumption that there are public lands that are being stolen. These are actually historically privately owned plots, and then it puts into question also, historically, why are these plots in the first place uh, privately owned? What sort of conception we have of the city and that we have today? Then by looking, by crossing the, the property map with a legal framework, we start to build an argument on what happened and why did it happen this way. In addition to the legal uh, research, we also did like a very in-depth ethnographic account. We, to us, it was very important to look at three things. The legal aspect, to look at what the coast or the seafront meant historically to residents, and what are the current practices of how people use space today. And it's through these three aspects that we were able to develop our arguments. Doing the, the historical research, we looked at old texts, at old narratives, and also at academic works written on the seafront. There was a very interesting clash between the official history of Beirut versus how residents of Beirut actually relate to their history. And so when we were doing in-depth interviews with residents who are today 70 years old, and asked them, we, we interviewed like almost 20 elderly people and asked them, well, what public spaces did you go to in the 50s and the 60s? And all of them talked about sites that were not necessarily back then considered as public parks. So a lot of them talked about uh, Delhi, talked about Hesh Beirut, talked about uh, the sands of Uzai, talked about the rocks in Ayn Mraise. And so they referred to natural sites, and their relationship to these natural sites was very much related to a very local notion of cultural heritage that has to do with cultural practices. So there was a major cultural practice called Seran. Seran is like the picnic, but historically it was very much a family activity, and it entailed either an entire weekend or an entire day. So families would like gather food and go walking to natural sites and spend the entire day with their food, with their music instruments. And this was very much how they related to public space. It was very much about their sociocultural practices. None of them, for example, mentioned Sanaya Park. So that the notion of a modern park, a scripted space with very delineated boundaries, was not really part of how they related to public space. But then when we were looking at academic writings or we were looking at people who wrote about the history of Beirut, none of these sites were actually present in their writings. And this brought a lot the idea of who writes the history of the city and how the history of the city is written from a very particular lens. You have these academics who talk about public space in the 50s and 60s mainly through the lens of the middle and upper middle classes and where they went to. And that's why you would find a lot of photography of people posing in Sabah al Khail, which was very much a prominent public space in the 40s and 50s, and it very much originated from the French mandate. But nowhere was there actually documentation of how other sections of the society use these sites based on their sociocultural practices. And the third main branch of research was actually observing how people are using the seafront today. The different practices, what people did, and what sections of the seafront were more used by families rather than more used by individuals or more used than couples. And in this sense, Delhi was a very interesting site because it had a multiplicity of users, so it was very much during the day for families. But also on weekends, it was very much a space for migrant workers, for example, 
who, if you go to Delhi on Sunday, you'd see a large community of Filipino domestic workers who, on their day off, go to the site. These are all different sociocultural uh, current practices that people do, and we try to highlight all of these three aspects in this project. The outcome of the project is that we produced a booklet, a research book, and it's, it's online actually too. It was a sort of a performance, a site-specific performance, where audiences would go up on a boat from uh, Mina Inabrese to Mina Delhi, and along the way they would learn about the history of, of the coast and what's happening along it today. And it was a very important uh, form of engagement with different audiences because it actually made them build a different relationship with the seafront. So going on a boat from one side of the coast to another is something very much that used to happen before the Civil War. It was one of the main like local tours and people today have stopped doing it and our relationship with the seafront is mainly through uh, beach resorts, like we go pay and that's how we access the Beirut Sea. So audiences were actually building an alter alternative experience with the seafront and sort of building a relationship, which to us was as important as them learning about the research. It was actually more important because they were engaging on a one-to-one -one basis. And then after the performance ended, a lot of initiatives started popping up and that we had nothing to do with. And so a lot of people were asking, uh, what is this uh, group? Is it a research group? Is it a performance? Is it activism? Is it uh, media? It was significant that people could not tag what was this. They couldn't put it in a box. It was really looking at things in a multidisciplinary manner and actually putting them out there in, in diverse forms. The research took a life of its own because it was put out in the public in, in a way that could be easily used. And then what we also did is that the performance ended, we made the effort of turning it into a sound piece and putting it online and anybody could download the sound piece and go take the tour and relive this experience. This project that we did in Beirut in 2012, we sort of wanted to extend it to other Lebanese cities, but we also wanted to do it in a different way. So we went to the city of Saida, and instead of us doing the research and us developing the, the performance, we worked with a local group of young activists, young artists, young researchers, who were passionate about the issue of the seafront and public space more generally. And we conducted with them training workshops on our work methodologies, and they ended up actually producing uh, the work. What was interesting about Saida, and very different from Beirut, in Saida there was a prominent photographer uh, who lived from the 40s, and he passed away recently. His name is Hashem Madani. He used to have a photo studio, and what made him different from a lot of other photo studios at the time is that not only did people come to his studio to take photos, he actually used to go out in the city with his camera and photograph people on their outings, on their holidays, in public spaces. And so we had an entire archive of sociocultural practices in Saida, in public space in the 1950s. And then these as documents were in themselves such an important account of what the city looked like and what its seafront looked like. And so you have photos like this on the sandy seafront, which also challenged a lot of preconceptions about Saida being a very conservative city because you had a woman in a swimsuit in the 1950s, and this is something that's almost impossible to see today in, pub in the public on the Saida public beach. And then you had these amazing photos of what was called Bahr al-Eid in Saida. During the Eid of Ramadan in Beirut, they call it Hirsh al-Eid because the Eid was celebrated in Hirsh Beirut. Interestingly, in Saida, it was called Bahr al-Eid because Eid was celebrated on the seafront. The fishermen were a very, very important part of these celebrations because on these three days they would transform their wooden boats into swings.
And so with the participants, each one took a site and uncovered the history of that site. And you would start to see these state planning projects that would, day after day, compromise these sites, destroy them, to rebuild a vision for the city that totally marginalizes the sites that are used by the most marginal or popular of communities. So it's not always an issue of illegality or bad planning. It's actually very conscious planning towards a very specific vision. It's, that that it's just that this vision is not inclusive of all interests. It's only inclusive of a very specific interest of a, of a certain privileged class that would like the city to look in a certain way. And so a highway was passed in the early 90s and it completely destroyed the site of Bahr al -Aid. Now, a similar research was done on the legal history and how the recent master plan also changed the zoning of the sandy beach to enable today the erection of, of hotels and so on. And so out of like, all this research, we did a site-specific performance in one of uh, Saida's uh, open spaces along the seafront made by the seven participants who took the workshop and each one uh, had worked on a, on a specific site along the coast and turned their research into a performance. These are like two examples of, uh, of projects we did in the last six years that are more related to the seafront.